the dream you're seeing is so rare and unique that people fly thousands of miles just to take a ride on it. And yet, back in the day, no one wanted it. Some of its design decisions make it better than any modern tram. Yet, for the same reasons, it could randomly set itself on fire. This is the tram that makes us question our idea of progress. It reminds us that the things we take for granted might one day become the things we miss the most. This is the RVR6, an unlicensed Soviet copy of the American PCC streetcar. And today it will teach us how beauty can emerge from imperfection, how treasures can be found where no one's looking, and how to turn our own flaws into everlasting charm. One of my earliest memories of being outside is seeing a pair of blue trams pulling away from the stop ahead of us. No matter how much we wanted to, we had no chance of getting on it. Instead, we had to wait for the next tram, the boring, boxy red one. Those red trams were everywhere, unremarkable and uninspiring. But that blue one? It was something special. It had rounded edges, single headlights and wooden interiors. It felt like a time machine, a portal to an era I never got to experience. Today we see this smooth, chubby, one-eyed tram as a romantic relic of the past, an era where things seemed to be simpler and better. But the people who actually had to use it might not share our nostalgia. In 1948, shortly after World War II ended, Riga's Wagonbuh Srupnica, an experienced tram and train manufacturing factory in the recently annexed Latvian Soviet Republic, began developing this tram. The process took over a decade, and production finally started in 1960. By then, the original PCC tram design was already 24 years old, making the RVR6 outdated from the start. For instance, it still relied on a compressed air system to open and close doors, engage drum brakes, operate windshield wipers, and even ring the bell. Most PCC trams at the time were fully electric, using independent miniature motors for all these functions. Switching to electric actuators was a major step forward, simpler, more reliable and far more efficient technology. Running air ducts throughout the tram and maintaining a network of rubber tubes, that was so 1920s. The RVR6 had only front and rear doors, there was no middle door. In most Soviet systems, the rear door was designated for entry only. This meant every passenger had to walk through the entire car to exit, which became a hassle during rush hour. Some really weird design choices were made. For example, there was no separate low voltage circuit. The 48 volt battery was wired directly to the 600 volts overhead line in series with the air compressor, light bulbs, cooling fans and traction motor field windings. The high voltage was evenly distributed across all these components and under normal conditions the system functioned properly. However, if a single battery cell failed and shorted, the voltage would spike which could either burn out all the cockpit light bulbs or, in the worst case scenario, cause a fire that could destroy the entire car. Because of all this, this cute, charming, nostalgia-inducing tram, an icon of the Soviet 60s and 70s, wasn't exactly well loved in its time. Only 6000 units were produced while the USSR imported twice as many Tatra T3s from abroad. 
Even in its hometown of Riga, it was unwelcome, as it was 15 cm wider than the medieval city's maximum permitted tramcar dimensions. Three demonstration trams had to be manually narrowed at the depot, and as soon as the opportunity arose, they were sent back to the factory. At the time, the country was conquering space, developing nuclear energy, and advancing science in every direction. High-rise apartment buildings, synthesizer music, wearable electronics… Progress was everywhere. But this tram? It reminded people of vulgar jazz, pointless jewelry, silent black-and-white films, and zeppelins. No one wanted that. My grandmother especially disliked this tram. She'd say, Ugh, it's old and shabby. And the seats are as low as toilets. In 2025, only one city in the world still operates these trams in regular service. Khabarovsk, Russia. It's even farther than China. You have to spend 8 hours on a plane from Moscow just to get there. And people do. They travel to Khabarovsk solely for the chance to ride the 1987 RVR6 in active passenger service. There is something special about it, something irreplaceable. And I think I know what it is. Remember that absurd setup where all low voltage equipment was wired directly to high voltage just to avoid having a separate low voltage circuit? The one that sometimes blew out every light bulb or, on occasion, the entire tram? The engineers were not crazy. They wanted to achieve something. Let me explain. If you're not an engineer, this might surprise you but trams have batteries. While they typically get power from overhead wires, they still need to function when that power is lost. For example, if the electricity goes out, the tram must be able to open its doors so passengers can exit. If it happens at night, the hazard lights need to stay on to keep the tram visible on the road. There are many other reasons but the fact remains, trams have batteries, and the batteries need to be charged, and it's not an easy task. The overhead wire voltage is usually around 6 or 700 volts DC, but to charge a 24 volt battery, you need to step that voltage down. The problem? You can't use a standard transformer with DC. Those only work with AC. The common solution was to run a dedicated small 700 volts DC motor not to move the tram, but to spin a generator that produced 24 volt DC in order to charge the battery. As absurd as that might sound, this was a standard approach everywhere until the late 70s. If you've ever heard a tram making a deep rumbling noise while stopped at a traffic light or stop, that was a generator at work, charging the battery. In the 70s, the widespread adoption of MOSFET transistors enabled the development of DC voltage converters without any moving parts. The electric transportation industry eagerly embraced this new technology. Modern trams no longer rely on generators to power the low-voltage circuits. But that didn't make them silent. In fact, for many of us, especially those on the spectrum, it made things even worse. Modern trams whine annoyingly all the damn time. This high-pitched noise comes from MOSFET transistors, inductors, transformers, and chokes, generating harmonics in the audible range. It also excites nearby components, resonates with the PCB, and ultimately gives you a headache. 
By now, you probably understand why the RVR6 doesn't have a low voltage circuit. It's completely silent when stopped. No rumbling, no whining, nothing. An absolute luxury for tired ears. Another major source of annoying noise in trams is a door closing mechanism. The Tatra T3, an iconic Eastern Bloc tram and another copy of the PCC, is notoriously famous for its horribly squeaky door drives. And I won't even mention the horrendous chain driven door mechanism of the KTM5. Meanwhile, the supposedly complex and outdated compressed air system closed doors smoothly and silently. If you happen to be in the way, they didn't slam into you like those harsh, unfeeling electric motors. Yes, it was a true luxury. The RVR6 is like a luxury car. Everyone who's owned one knows they are terrible for daily driving. They have baffling design choices questionable build quality and spend half the life in the repair shop. Sports cars aren't easy to get in or out of, and if you're tall, forget about seeing anything through those low slung windows while standing. Premium vehicles might not have the best engine or transmission, but it's a meticulous attention to seemingly minor details like the silence at the stop, the warm glow of rounded light fixtures, or the comfort of spring-loaded seats that creates real emotion and makes the ride unforgettable. When I was a toddler, I knew nothing about voltage converters, compressed air systems, or regenerative braking. What I did notice was modern technology designed purely for utility versus retro technology that also considered the emotional experience. And I always preferred the latter. The RVR6 was one of only two Soviet trams permitted to form not just two car, but three car tram trains, ensuring that more passengers could get a seat. This local newspaper honors Maria, a tram driver who, along with three other women, operated the first three car tram trains in my hometown. Novosibirsk. Having only two doors also made for a more comfortable experience in harsh climates, as it reduced the amount of cold air entering the car when idling at stops. This feature earned the tram a solid reputation in Komsomorsk on Amur, a city north of Khabarovsk, where these trams faithfully served residents until the tram system was dismantled in the late 2010s. The system, built almost entirely by the hands of its own citizens, was shut down when the city hall couldn't afford to renovate a deteriorating bridge. Our little railway, as locals fondly called it, ceased to exist. Keeping these aging trams running for so long was a true testament to the scale and dedication of the depot workers, and it was celebrated by railway fans across the country. Interestingly, on the other side of the continent, in the city of Daukavpils, Latvia, these trams remained in regular service until recently. They even preserved one and still bring it out for the tourist rides once in a while. The rest, however, 
were sent to the scrapyard. Still, that was a decent outcome compared to elsewhere. In Novosibirsk, as in most of Russia, the 90s were a death sentence for these tramps. They were gradually phased out, one by one, with the remaining ones relegated to the most neglected, low-frequency routes. Picture an old, battered, one-eyed tram rattling along crooked tracks, cutting through dirt roads and past rickety wooden houses. What a sad way to age. However, the RVR6 did not go down without a fight. It lived in style and it died in style. One of the most common sights on the streets of the late USSR was individual parking garages. The land was considered communal property, meaning anyone who wanted to use it could, so these garages were built everywhere. They provided protection from harsh weather, theft and hijackings. Some were even mass-produced. Those were called rakushka, meaning seashell. But there weren't enough to go around, so most people had to weld the yarn together, using metal sheets sourced from who knows where. Among the sea of rust-colored, boxy and often ugly structures, some stood out. They weren't just cookie-cutter metal sheds with triangular roofs. They had smooth, rounded shapes, echoes of something from the past. And that's because they were from the past. They were made from the body parts of the RVR6. Local tram enthusiasts even managed to trace exactly which decommissioned units some of these garages came from. In the 90s, the Novosibirsk tram depot sold off retired RVR6 through local newspaper ads. Some ended up as security booths in garden communities. Now, a century after its original design, the RVR6 still lives on reminding us of a time when the things around us were hand-drawn by talented artists. Designed by engineers who loved the work and wanted to make the world a better place. Objects that not only served a purpose, but also brought aesthetics and joy into our lives. And even a hundred years later, they continue to do so. Наша маленькая железная дорога. 